Section 1 First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good morning, everyone. I'm getting very excited about this trip to Greece, and I'm sure you are too. As you know, we didn't have all the details at our last meeting, but I can give them to you now. We leave London Gatwick Airport on British Airways next Wednesday. Please be sure to be at the airport by 4.30. I know it's early, but our departure time is 8.25 a.m. We're quite a large group, and we don't want to have any hassles. Please be sure to have all your travel documents ready. We'll arrive in Athens at 2.25 in the afternoon and there'll be a vehicle there to meet us. It'll be a full-size coach, so everyone can travel together. We'll spend three full days in Athens, and we book for two nights accommodation in the hotel. The second day, we'll go to the National Archaeological Museum to see the enormous collection of ancient Greek works of art, antiques, statues, a brilliant display. We'll eat out at a typical Greek restaurant on Thursday night. It's going to be a very busy time in Athens. Friday morning and afternoon we'll visit historic sites, but we have nothing planned for the rest of the day. On Saturday we're off to the islands, the Greek islands of ancient myth and modern romance. Now, the big news. At first we thought we'd take the ferry, but we've been very lucky to secure a sailing boat which is big enough for all of us. I'm really excited about this part of the trip because we'll see the islands to the best advantage and we'll be able to cruise around and sleep on board. We'll get off at different islands and for one part of the trip we'll have people playing Greek traditional music actually on board with us. Now... I'll pass out a brochure with all the details. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. A lot of work has gone into organising this tour and I'd like to thank in particular the travel agent who got us a really good deal and the people at the British Museum who offered us such good advice. Trips like this only happen because of the hard work of really expert people. As you know, we have planned a gathering for when we return. I have a list of things which the committee would like you to bring to the party. They are your pictures and something to eat for everyone to share. You are bound to have people ask what we have in common and why we are travelling as a group. I suppose the answer is that we are interested in learning about old societies and vanished cultures and we all enjoy travelling. Of course, we enjoy fine food too, but that's not as important. I nearly forgot the last piece of information. You will see there are labels which I have passed around for you to put on all your luggage. Could you fill them in, please? On the top line, please write 
Greek tour. And on the lower line, write in block letters, I mean uppercase, the letters AA and the number 3. That's AA3. We need to have these labels clearly displayed to help the baggage handlers to keep our luggage together on the different parts of our trip. So please, don't take them off. That is the end of section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2 First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this Humanities Lecture. Today we're going to continue our look at the modern diseases that afflict society. We're going to look at quite a famous but rare disease. The popular name for this disease is mad cow disease. It's been so named because it's most often found in the brains of cattle. It attacks the nervous functions of the brain and leads to unusual behaviour by the cattle. Thus, we familiarly say that the cow is therefore mad, and hence, mad cow disease. Mad cow disease is the commonly used name, but its medical title is bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or BSE. It's a slowly progressive, degenerative, fatal disease affecting the nervous system of adult cattle. The exact form of BSE is not known, but it's generally accepted by the scientific community that the likely cause is an infectious form of a type of protein known as a prion. This protein develops abnormalities and apparently seems to encourage other proteins to become similarly misshapen, affecting their ability to function. In cattle with BSE, these abnormal prions initially occur in the small intestines, tonsils and central nervous tissues. There is a similar disease to BSE called Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, or CJD, that's found in people. A variant form of CJD is believed to be caused by eating contaminated beef products from BSE-affected cattle. The abnormal prions in infected cattle products are consumed by humans as they are resistant to common food disinfection treatments such as heat. The disorder is rare, occurring in about one out of one million people. To date, there have been 155 confirmed and probable cases of CJD worldwide among the hundreds and thousands of people that may have consumed BSE-contaminated beef products. Most of the cases have occurred in the UK. The one US case was in a young woman who contracted the disease while residing in the UK and developed symptoms after moving to the US. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. CJD is a disorder involving rapid decrease of mental function and movement. As with BSE in cattle, these abnormalities are believed to be caused by damage done to the brain by prions, though it has been proved that in rare cases it can be genetically inherited. CJD tends to affect younger people, beginning between the ages of 20 and 70, with average age at onset of symptoms in the late 50s. Early symptoms include personality changes and difficulty with coordination. Once symptoms appear, the disorder progresses rapidly and may be confused with other types of dementia such as Alzheimer's disease. CJD, though, is distinguished by extremely rapid progression from onset to symptoms to disability and death. So, how did BSE and CJD come about? We've not read about them in the history books. These appear to be new diseases. BSE was first reported in the United Kingdom. The exact origins of BSE remain uncertain. But it is thought that cattle initially may have become infected when given feed contaminated with scrapie infected sheep meat and bone meal. Scrapie is a sheep prion disease similar to BSE in cattle. The scientific evidence suggests that the UK BSE outbreak in cattle was then spread by feeding BSE contaminated cattle protein to calves. Thus, we have created the disease ourselves. Cattle, naturally, are grazers, feeding on grass. We have given cattle feed derived from sheep, an unnatural food for cattle. We have compounded our mistake by also feeding young cattle with feed derived from older cattle, making them cannibals. There is a kind of horror associated with it when we look at it like this. There is also a kind of poetic justice that the disease is passed down to us as we consume the animals that we have infected. Moving on now, are there any questions with what I've said so far? That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Well, Fred, thanks for coming over to my room. Oh, that's OK. I had a lecture near here this morning, so it was easy to come over. We've got to get on with this North Sea oil project anyway. So, did you manage to do any of the things that we decided last week? Most of the things. I got all the books from the library and saw Mr. Peters about the research. He told me the names of some good sites on the internet where I could find lots of information about the North Sea oil industry safety issues. He's a great tutor, isn't he? Yes, he is. So I checked out the sites and made some notes. What about you? 
Did you get the information on the background and history of the North Sea oil industry? Yeah, there were loads of information and I've made notes too. I think I've got it all covered. So let me tell you what I've found out. I'll run the ideas past you and you can tell me if it's okay. Good idea. So, as you know, the North Sea lies to the east and northeast of England and Scotland. Apparently, the North Sea was long dismissed as a potential source of oil or gas, but over the last four decades it has become the centre of one of the world's most productive energy industries. Gas was actually first found in quantity in the Groningen area of the Netherlands in 1959. This was followed by the first British discovery of gas in the West Sole Field off the coast of East Anglia by the BP drilling rig Seagem late in 1965. Actually, the first accident was on that rig too. Anyway, sorry. Go on, Judith. The British oil and gas industry in the southern North Sea grew rapidly in the early years. The deepening economic crisis in the UK meant that there was enormous pressure on the industry to get gas and later oil flowing. As exploration and investment moved further north, it became clear that there was oil to be found in great quantities. Discoveries of oil grew in number as more companies, British, European and American, took out leases on sectors of the North Sea. During the 1990s, like the rest of the world, the North Sea industry was badly affected by the global price fluctuations. Nevertheless, production grew and peaked around 2000-2001. Now, the North Sea is regarded as a mature province on a slow decline. That's about it for now. I'll put more detail into it when we do the presentation. You know, statistics and all that. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Yes, you've done a good job. Shall I do the same then? It's not as long as yours. Go ahead. OK then. As I said earlier, the first industrial accident related to the industry in the North Sea happened only days after they discovered the first gas. The sea gem capsized with the loss of 13 lives. There are regular accidents on all oil rigs around the world, but the North Sea is just such a harsh environment that there always seems to be more there. The most famous accident, and the worst disaster in the North Sea, was in the Piper Alpha disaster of 1988. Yes, I remember that one on the news when it happened. Today, the industry is very safety conscious. When you first arrive, you are given a safety tour of the installation detailing all safety aspects, including fire extinguishers, emergency muster stations, lifeboat stations and emergency procedures. You will be introduced to the RIG safety program. Everyone attends weekly safety meetings and daily pre-tour meetings. The weekly meeting is an in-depth look at industry-wide safety news and other safety-related issues on the RIG. Companies share safety information with other companies throughout the industry. This helps to avoid repeated incidents. A fire and boat drill is often held on the same day, which involves a mock fire and a mock abandon the rig exercise. The pre-tour meeting is usually a description of the work carried out when you are off shift. The work you will be doing, the work others are currently doing that may affect you and any other relevant issues of the day. Accidents do still happen, as in every industry. However, statistics show that with the massive improvements in offshore safety procedures, you now have a higher chance of having fatal accidents if you work on a building site than you do when on an oil rig. Well, that's all from me. I'll add lots of details too. OK, well let's plan what we have to do next.
That is the end of section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4 First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. We were required to do the investigation regarding survival strategies of particular animals, and I chose to study how the butterflies will do for survival when cold weather and food shortage could easily influence their life cycle. I concentrated on a number of main strategies butterflies adopt to handle these harsh conditions, hibernation and migration. First, let's talk about the hibernation, which means a long-term sleep in which an animal's metabolism slows to conserve strength. Various butterfly species have formed different patterns of hibernation at continuous periods of their life cycle. For example, the banded hair freak hardly hibernates in its full-grown adult form, but as an egg. And another species, the dappled white, breathes during the winter in a crystallized stage, and during this time, it's able to draw on the energy it stimulated earlier on in its larval stage. Though the slowing of the metabolism in hibernation functions with many of the difficulties faced in winter, it can't prevent them all. In addition, some butterflies have extra plans for survival. For instance, they develop a substance in their blood, usually in glycerol or sorbitol, which serves as antifreeze, thereby adding extra resistance against lower temperatures. Actually, there is a positive side to the cold weather. Fewer predators exist to cause problems. This is because they're mainly active in warm weather. So, now let's move on to the second type of survival strategy the butterflies used in winter. Migration. That means moving to regions with a more suitable environment. I'm going to start this topic with a detailed study about particular cases of migratory species. The monarch butterfly. Many butterfly species found in various zones of the world migrate, like the red admiral, a British butterfly which winters in North Africa, but the monarch butterfly is the sole example to do this in North America. At any stage of the life cycle, the monarch cannot survive in the low winter temperatures, so when it gets cold, the monarchs begin to gather in huge groups and fly south. They can travel up to three and a half thousand miles. But only the last summer generation of monarchs migrate. Normal generations only live for a maximum of 10 days. In fact, the last migration generation, as reported, do for six months, which enables them to take such a long journey. These huge teams of migrating monarchs only fly during daylight hours, and at night they usually have a rest in trees, again often in vast groups. Research is now being done into what encourages them to reach the destination. It has been known for years that they find their way on the journey by following rivers, and there are a few of these along the migratory route. However, the new research indicates that they may also treat the sun as a navigational aid. During this time, they are able to feed, mainly from a type of flower called milkweed, but they are not able to reproduce during this period. The monarchs 
hand in their lineage to a particular region in Mexico, known as the Pierre a Sequoia. The monarchs are anticipated with great interest within the region, and over recent years, their annual arrival has gained great popularity among tourists. However, their habitat is being increasingly threatened. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answer.